England felt very different. I've been to England quite a number of times. It has not been so exciting having seen it many times. This time it was uh, quite poignant, I think, as a result of having been disconnected from the world and just simply um, seeing seeing a culture that is surprisingly different. I mean, you don't, I think one forgets how different it is, um, was remarkable. But okay, I went to Bath and, and this conference was um, a conference of primarily COVID dissidents of one form or another. It was organized um, by Tess Laurie and her group, whose name I always forget. Um, but in any case, uh, I was doing some presenting at this conference and I was doing some hosting of panels. The conference was quite uh, eclectic in terms of who who was there. I did get to meet quite a number of uh, people who, strangely, you and I have been in battle alongside many of these people, but have only met some of them uh, in person. And it was almost indescribably, um, what's the word? It was uh, comforting mm. just to meet them in person, right? Garrett Vandenbosch was there. Ryan Cole, who actually doesn't live so far from us. He's in Idaho. Um, He's a pathologist. He's a pathologist. I will return to him shortly. I, I found what he had to say remarkable. Um, uh, I got to meet uh, Phil Harper, who we had not met before. So in any case, oh, and uh, I had not met Tess Laurie. We certainly mm -hmm. um, interacted over Zoom. But anyway, to be in the company of all of these people who have been fighting in parallel against the same amorphous well-resourced, diabolical enemy, and I, I hate to describe it in those terms, but the way it behaves leaves no doubt on the part of those who have been targeted by it that there is a something. I don't know how it works. I don't know how many organizations are collaborating, but you know, we do know that uh, Gavi exists, the Trusted News uh, Initiative exists. <coughs> we know that the CDC has dictated a certain amount, the WHO. Um, so anyway, there are these organizations and they clearly share a perspective and they clearly target people who step out of line. Um, so in, in any case, something indescribable about meeting these people um, oh, Neil Oliver was there also, mm -hmm. I must say. That was uh, quite cathartic to meet him in person and, uh, you know, look him in the eye and um, to just, you know, the, the joy of discovering that such a person exists. For those of you who don't know Neil Oliver, you probably do know him. You've probably seen a uh, soliloquy or two um, distributed on Twitter. Um, but he's really he's really a lovely person. But in any case, I just wanted to give a few um, of the insights uh, from the conference. I think the one that struck me most was hearing from people who have been vaccine injured, being able to talk to them privately. So there were presentations, but you know, also being able to talk to these people privately and just get a sense not only for what they've been through um, medically but maybe even more importantly, what they have been through in the aftermath of having their injuries. Um, like socially. Yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, there are a lot of things about this last year that have been utterly jaw dropping. But I think the one that sticks with me most, the thing that I am going to have the hardest time uh, forgetting is the gaslighting of people who did what they were asked to do mm -hmm. and were injured in the process. Now, let's say... And then were treated as despicable liars or, or non-existent, right? Right. Like you, how, how, how dare you have been injured? How dare you talk about it? How dare you bring this to anyone's attention, don't you see that you're part of the problem? Right. And and the insanity is so deep that in general, one of the things that these people most frequently hear is that they are anti-vaxxers, <laughs> right? These are people who took the vaccine and were injured by it and then are accused of being anti-vaxxers. They are effectively denied care. They are told that it's in their minds. Mm -hmm. They're doctors who do know how to treat them, Paul Merrick in particular. Um, 
delivers a very compelling, I mean, you know, tears in his eyes. He says, I'm faced with these people. I know how to treat them, but I'm not allowed to, right? His hands have been tied. To hear that story, I guess the point is, what kind of civilization? I mean, even, let's say that the vaccines were exceedingly safe, right? And the occasional person got severely injured, right? As far as I'm concerned, that person is a hero, right? They got the, the short straw in a thing that they did for everybody. Everybody did their part. These people came up with the short straw. They are entitled to an extraordinary level of care. They're entitled to better care than most people have because their injury comes from doing something. They participated in something that was ostensibly to foster our collective well-being. You know, it feels a little bit, um, maybe this is a bad analogy, but uh, as you're talking, it reminds me of um, how Vietnam vets were treated when they came back. <laughs> it's exactly the thought, right? Yeah. Yeah. You sign up yeah. because your government says your country needs you. Mm -hmm. Something terrible happens to you. You need care. You come back. You can't, your mind doesn't accept that you are now at peace and you can't live a normal life. How is it that these people are not receiving extraordinary care? And why do we not compare how these people are treated? Like with, all, sorry, all war vets, but I, the Vietnam war vets were it treated was, particularly brutally it by was particularly society. particularly right? bad because yeah. society had no patience for that war by the end. Right. Right. But nonetheless, it seems to me that at the point on the front end of their recruiting effort where they're saying, hey, your country needs you, sign up. It's really important, right? Yeah. The first question ought to be, well, how are you going to treat me if it doesn't go well? Yeah. What happens if what happens if I do what you say and I end up severely harmed by it? Mm -hmm. Are you still going to be there? And if the answer to that question is no, then the answer is sorry. That's not the deal. Yeah. If my country needs me, then my country should take care of me if it doesn't go well, right? Right. And so these people responded to the call. These people, now you're talking about the people the vaccine who are the vaccine injured. injured yeah. The vaccine injured responded to the call. And frankly, if you, we are going to be blamed, despite the fact that you and I are vaccine enthusiasts, that a book written before COVID happened lists vaccines as one of the three great medical discoveries, right? Though that's who we are, and we're demonized as anti-vaxxers, sure. right? How many anti-vaxxers do you create when you injure people with a vaccine and then pretend they're not hurt, right? How many people is that going to drive, rightly drive away, mm -hmm. analytically drive away? I'd be crazy if to If they're take lying that about this, what else are they lying about? Right. And if, if they're, they're treating me like this over what is happening now, who else has experienced what that I don't know about? Yes. Hmm. It's very, very safe. Really? Totally safe? Yes, totally safe. And if it turns out that it hurts me, does that mean you, that you will then take care of me? No, we're going to treat you like garbage, mm -hmm. right? It's like, yeah. I, I can't believe that we can't just simply see how the dots connect, right? So yep. I, I guess I, I, I am beyond fed up, right? Yeah. The, the gaslighting of people who spoke up was terrible. The gaslighting of people who did what they were asked and were harmed by it, and some of them severely harmed, right? That is unconscionable. It's unconscionable. And I guess I would ask others, right? Those who just wish this topic would go away. Are you okay with that? Right? Yeah. Maybe you took the vaccine. Maybe it went well. Are you okay with people who made the same choice that you did and will never live a normal life again being treated like this by the governments that asked them to do it, that asked you to do it? You're really okay with that? I can't imagine how you could be. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's that. I will also say, I think Ryan Cole, the pathologist, has a special role to play. And I'm troubled that there seems to be only one of him, right? Only one pathologist who is speaking publicly about what he's saying. Right. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I haven't. When you were talking it. to me, as you know, you just came home yesterday, um, <clears throat> as you know. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, but when you were trying to, when you were sort of giving me a, a quick overview of, of, of what you had seen and experienced and everything there, uh, my question to you was, where are all the other pathologists? Right. And I don't think we know the answer to that question. Um, it is especially troubling. You know, it could be that you wouldn't, the pathologists aren't seeing anything, or aren't seeing anything yet, but that can't be right. Right. So what is, I don't, I don't know to what degree you're free to talk about what 
you understand from Dr. Cole. Well, uh, if, if, if you are, you might share some of... So for those of you who haven't thought about what a pathologist is, yeah. a pathologist is a, a doctor who sees specimens, but not patients, right? This is somebody whose specialty is looking... I hope, Ryan, if I have this slightly wrong, that you'll uh, gently reach out and I will correct it. But um, that basically, the point is, this is you know how a radiologist is a doctor you never see. The doctor looks at the scans or the MRIs or whatever it is that you've got and says, aha, uh-huh, that shadow there is a something or other. Well, the pathologist is somebody who's looking... It's like blood cultures and tissue cultures, tissue slides. Tissue cultures, and, biopsies, yeah. all sorts of stuff. So they see this. And what this means for... A pathologist, you know, Ryan Cole has many years of experience behind the microscope, right? He's there for the beginning of COVID. He's there for the vaccine program and what he's well, seen. And he's, and he's there decades before. Right. Like, I don't know how old he is, but at least like many, many years before. Many years before. Yeah. So in that time, you will see transitions in how many of this type of cancer you see and that type of cancer and this type of dysfunction, that type of dysfunction. And so the point is, this is a doctor who sees way more patients than most. So if a doctor, you know- Because he doesn't see whole people, he sees samples. Right, exactly. And so, you know, he has a much larger data set than most people do. And he's in a position to see change in a way that if you were a doctor in an office seeing patients, you might see that change, but you wouldn't necessarily know whether it was noise Right, yeah. just a sample uh, size is lower. It's just harder to know. It's just harder to know. Yep. Right. So he's seeing all these things, including lots of cancers, very sudden cancers, right? Cancers that were dormant and then suddenly are in stage four. This kind of thing, um, you know. And he is profoundly altered by looking at the change in what patients are facing and his own profession and their ignoring of these patterns, which mm-hmm. um, I don't know what we do about it because with one pathologist, it's very hard for this point to be successfully made, but um, it, it's a very, his report is very stark and it is consistent with the other doctors, right? There's there are a lot of doctors at this conference, including, you know, Malone. So did you, did you specify the, the timing? Maybe I was thinking about something else you were saying, but did you specify are you free to specify the timing of when he starts seeing uh, an explosion of, uh, of of cancers? I don't think I know, although he has spoken about it publicly. There's mm-hmm. actually um, a, an interview clip that people will probably have seen on Twitter where he's seated. I believe he's seated with books behind him, and he is discussing these cancers that he is suddenly seeing uh, emerge. And the question is, is this attributable to COVID or vaccines or both? Um I believe, well, I'm going to leave that to Ryan. I'm going to interview him. But, oh, um, great. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. No, I, I think it's a it's a must do. Mm-hmm. Um, he is certainly seeing a lot of pathology that he believes is vaccine in nature, and he would be in a position to know because the difference between 2020 yep. and 2021 is the vaccines. Yep. 